check with our organizers. Great, we're here, ready, we're gonna get started. Um, so, thank you everyone for being here. Thanks everyone at home. Um, I'm gonna start out today by addressing uh, the elephant in the room. Why are we talking about stock exchanges today? And I'm sure a lot of you are wondering that. Um, not you on the panel, I hope you know <laughs> why you're here. Um, but when you think of stock exchanges, I'm sure um, images conjure in your head of a loud room with a lot of men perhaps shouting, um, numbers moving quickly, stocks jumping. Um, you probably aren't thinking about the environment um, and how stock exchanges are helping the environment. Um, so if this is you, you're not alone. Uh, I often get blank stares when I tell people what my job is and um, how I work with stock exchanges to enhance sustainability and enable a just transition to carbon neutral economies. They look at me as if I'm from Mars, but if I'm from Mars, I'm not alone. <laughs> so thanks so much for my panelists for being here today with me. On behalf of the United Nations Sustainable Stock Exchanges Initiative, we are sincerely grateful to our partners in this event, uh, the UNF Triple C, and particularly to Masamba and Sylvia. Thanks so much for all of your support, and to the UNF Triple C's Innovation Hub for hosting us here today. Um, and then, of course, our esteemed panelists who are here with us today. These are the people that make sure that the rubber hits the road and who push the envelope in their companies and in their markets. The Sustainable Stock Exchanges Initiative, or the SSE, has been working with stock exchanges since um, 2009, thereabout, to identify how they can support and promote innovative solutions to sustainable development. You may be surprised to know that the SSE now has 110 members from the largest to the smallest stock exchanges around the globe. And the initiative exists only, however, because of people like these panelists. We have five here and we have um, one online as well with us today um, who have made it their mission to make markets not only efficient but also transparent and just. These six speakers have all been innovative in their own careers and we're asking them today to share a bit of that innovative spark with all of you here today. For me, innovation at a stock exchange is really uh, threefold. Uh, two of these points I'm gonna pull from our latest um, guidance document that we developed um, with two of our speakers here today, David and Shamila from the LSE Group and from the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Um, together, we developed a guidance on um, climate disclosure and an action plan on climate for stock exchanges. And we um, identified in our action plan kind of two key areas um, where stock exchanges are leading their markets or making movements here. And the first one I just um, gave a little hint to and that's leading their markets. Um, they're walking the talk, they're emulating the change that they want to see in their markets. So this includes committing to net zero, reporting on their own climate related risks and opportunities, and calculating emissions, reducing emissions, et cetera. Um, and then the other side of that coin is exchanges are also shaping their markets to enable innovation and promoting innovation. Um, this is done through listing segments, financial products, awards, training, education, and more. To these two points that we've highlighted in our guidance document, I wanted to add one more, which is agility, because the approaches that a lot of these stock exchanges are doing are showing a great amount of agility. So with that, I'd like to um, head to our speakers because they have a lot to share with us today. Um, and I want them to share with us a little bit about um, their expectations moving forward and how they can and are both leading and promoting innovation in their markets and how they expect agility to play a role in the future of capital markets. So with that, let's jump in with leadership. Um, I wanted to start with Harry Cho here from the Singapore Exchange. Um, the Singapore Stock Exchange was the um, only member of the task force on climate related financial disclosures. So Harry, would you mind sharing with us how your leadership as an exchange in helping to develop the TCFD recommendations helped you to guide your market and maybe share with us some strategies that you found to be most successful in educating companies on the urgency and necessity of integrating climate data into mainstream financial filings. Thanks a lot for that. Um, so before I talk about TCFD, it's worth mentioning that we've actually made sustainability reporting mandatory for our listed companies in 2016 already. So we were probably one of the first 
exchanges to have done that. So with that background, we were quite attuned, right, already to, to the fact that actually, if we wanted to continue future-proofing our markets, to ensure that there is, you know, Singapore being a global hub, um, to ensure that there is an ongoing capital flow into the markets and into the companies that are operating. So we were thinking of it as any other risk factor to future proof, help future proof our companies and the markets. Um, and when the opportunity arose to indeed uh, the offer came for us to champion TCFD, it was seemingly fairly early at the time, but we thought it's worth making that resource because um, having that early insight into how climate change is going to be shaped, uh, particularly relevant for exchanges, of course, is the disclosure standard, right, which is what TCFD is about. Um, we then accepted that role. And so having that early insight throughout the process of having that conversation within the task force, and they only had um, just over a year or so to come up with that framework in the first place. So constant internal feedback in order to see how, what's the best contribution we can be making and also ensure that there is that Asian input given that we're operating in Asia. Now, um, fast forward to today, we've just uh, recently closed the open consultation to make TCFD mandatory in our markets. Um, it's been one of the most popular open consultations with the public, so we are assimilating all of the feedback at this point. Um, we did lay down a roadmap for implementation over approximately three-year time period, you know, roll out over time, um, it, you know, different sectors, there'll be priority sectors and certain sectors that, that will be expected to make it more mandatory at a later stage. So um, I, I think what not with the disclosure, sorry, the announcement that came with, uh, you know, ISSB, you know, Value Reporting Foundation, CDSB, this is all coming together and we're so glad that we were at the heart of that innovation from the start. Now, then if you think about what's next in the disclosure front, um, of course there was the TNFD, so Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosure. Again, I mean, having done the task force work, we know how much work that is. It really is a significant amount of work and it gets added on top of what you do for the business, for the company, for the ecosystem, etc. But when the opportunity arose, we again accepted that. Um, so we're serving on the TNFD as well to really see how, how will the standards uh, evolve uh, actually act actively shaping how the standards should evolve to ensure that the financial markets and the companies capture both the risks and the opportunities and finally to make it practical. Great, thanks Harry and right on time. I just want to add on one point that you mentioned there um, about um, adding on top of your job. Um, so. I will pass to David with the next question, but I know this has been on top of your job significantly as well too. Um, so while you've been leading on TCFD as well in your market and moving that forward a lot, an important announcement was the leadership in um, net zero and your exchange committing to net zero. So can you talk to us a little bit about how that happened in your exchange and kind of getting your leadership involved in that and deciding the deliberations that happened within the exchange as to why you should move forward with this strategy? Thanks, Tiffany, and, and thanks for the UN Sustainable Stock Exchange for, you know, for organizing this great event and, and for all of the fantastic work you do in this space. It, it's, you know, we, it, we all, I think, really appreciate the work that you guys do. Um, the, we, you know, we'd been thinking about making a net zero commitment. We were going through the process to do that. And, but actually, at the po this point, which was last year, it was actually about committing to reducing our own emissions. And we did that through the business action one and a half degrees, but really that missed the point because clearly our impact is on markets much more broadly and how can we help accelerate marketplace decarbonisation. Um, I mean, and, and to put that in context, you know, when I started working in this area, which was 20 years ago when I joined the index company FTSE, which is part of the group, it, it was investors wouldn't take meetings to talk about this stuff. Today, this is the number one agenda item with pretty much every asset manager, every pension fund, pretty much every bank you speak to. Uh, and for us, it's really thinking about how do we systematically bring this in across all of our capabilities. And you hear all of the, you know, all, all the announcements today from GFANS, you know, 100 trillion plus moving on this. But the reality is, 
we're not going fast enough. It's very exciting, and there is this all this momentum, but emissions are still projected to go up by 15% or so this year, sorry, over the next, uh, by 2030, when they actually need to be coming down by over 40%. So we're seeing this going completely in the wrong direction, despite the fact we're getting... So how can the finance sector help things move further and faster? And how does business and finance work together? And so we're thinking about what's our role within that, and then thinking of breaking it down really across four things. Two things, which is what do business and finance need to do, and then two things, which is about what, what are the barriers we need to kind of address. So the two things we kind of need to try and do, and so we made these commitments at the same time, although it wasn't official at that point in terms of official commitments as part of the process, which it is now. But is, was the, two, the two things were um, how to help grow the green economy. So how do we help accelerate the growth of green industries? Um, and you know, there's a range of things going on there we can talk about. But that, that, and the other was the, kind of the, the more difficult thing, which is how do you help decarbonize all sectors of the economy, including high carbon industries, um, and get, make sure you've got credible you know, targets that companies are being incentivized to set, and that capital then is, you know, is, is supporting. You shouldn't be de you know, demonizing those industries. We need to be supporting them, but we need to also make sure that they're coming up with credible transition plans and that the finance and the investment follows whether they ha you know, when they have those plans. But the, the two barriers to this is, um, is the data and disclosure part. Because frankly, the investment and finance community don't have good information to go on, and we need much better data. So important all the work from TCFD, and so important then the work from UNSSE, and huge thanks to Shamila at, and JSE for co-chairing that work to develop. Because if exchanges can all work together to drive consistent data, the, you know, the International Sustainability Standards Board will be really helpful in helping to kind of accelerate this, but we don't have to wait until it's all done and dusted. We can be going with what we've got today. So the data and disclosure bit's really important. The exchanges have got a huge role to play. And then actually getting cross-market understanding and joining things up, because actually often the the corporate sector and the users of capital have got very little understanding really about what's going on amongst the investor and the finance community, don't really understand how this information gets used, how it affects investment flows, and, and the investment community often don't really feel that the companies get it, and we can be an interlocker between the two, helping drive meaningful action. And so what's happened with, with GFANS is now, with the new service provider designs, is formalizing in many ways much of this, making sure that we're committing to integrating climate into all of our capabilities and how we, how we, how we support our marketplaces decarbonize. Great, thanks David. Can you add just a moment on that global perspective as well and how important it is to have kind of global movement on this and consistency beyond markets, which I, I think we were trying to get through on the guidance. <laughs> so um, you know, a lot of this is, has been driven by very large asset owners. So pension funds have been waking up to the fact that they are intragenerational investors in some cases. They're certainly investing over decades. And, and the fact that they therefore have got this kind of, well, the, the, the concept that is often used is universal investor. They're effectively invested across the whole economy and they've got a, they've got a real interest in making sure that the economy grows in a stable way. And therefore, they want to make sure that they are influencing the system. So it's no longer really about whether company A outperforms company B, or even really if portfolio A outperforms portfolio B. They're interested, many of them are invested across the whole economy and across all listed companies, across bonds, across, across different asset classes. And their interest is therefore, um, how do they make it more stable and how can they drive changes? So they've been influencing the asset managers, they've also been influencing the banks and the service providers, and the expectation from the exchanges as well. So we need to give them the data and the tools to enable that drive. And they need, they're global investors, they need globally consistent data. And also exchanges by we're often very well plugged into our local policymakers, so we can also be quite influential in encouraging the policymakers not to go off in different directions, but to work together on single global standards. Perfect. Thanks, David. And for everyone in the room, that's David Harris from the London Stock Exchange Group. Um, I'm going to move on to um, Shamila, if I may. This is Shamila Ibrahim from the um, Johannesburg Stock Exchange, who's here with us from South Africa today. Um, 
Shamila, um, I'm going to talk a bit about promotion with you, if that's okay. Um, not to say that Johannesburg Stock Exchange is not a leader, because all of these exchanges are leaders in their own right. And of course, ESG reporting through the King Code really came out of South Africa some years ago now. So um, I think that there's a lot of leadership there, but there's a lo also a lot of balancing in the promotion in your market. And I'm wondering if you can talk to us a bit about how you as an exchange mal manage that balance between the E and the S of, and the G of the environmental, social, and government side. We, we often talk about. Thanks, Tiffany. Mm. And, uh, hi, everybody. Such an honor to be here. Thanks to the SSE for organizing this. When you talk about balance between the E, the S, and the G, I come from a part of the world where it isn't an either or. Uh, our social context and the issues that we face are probably as significant as the environmental issues. And if you look at the kind of global north, global south divide, uh, you know, we often get, you often hear, you know, environment is something we need to care about. Oh, by the way, when you start thinking about social issues, I would say that in South Africa, it's probably the other way around. Uh, we're one of the most unequal societies on earth, one of the highest Gini coefficients that you can find, and um, huge rates of unemployment, uh, big distances across the country between people, spatial planning from the apartheid era that actually really polarizes society in a country like ours. So our social context is, is massive in that regard, and it's something that our listed companies are quite aware of. Uh, and when you talk about companies not being able to thrive in a society that can fail or is failing, we are like a poster child for that. Mm. And we're also a part of the world where, for example, climate change, which is why we're here today at this event, um, is a big concern. We will, regardless of whatever the average temperature rises that we manage to keep to as a globe, will experience two to four degrees higher than the global average. That is a serious impact for this part of the world. Uh, South Africa is already a water-scarce country, and uh, so we need to acknowledge that. So the, the kind of multifaceted challenges that we need to face uh, are there and are very real. So they're a lot more tangible. Now, if I go back to the perspective of the exchange, our first lever is governance. Um, we are a self-regulatory organization, so we're a frontline regulator, but we're also an exchange, you know, that's a business and, and things like that. So there's Chinese walls between the regulatory aspects and the rest of the business. And how do we then use those levers together to be able to act on these various issues and, uh, and understand how we want to drive the market as a force for good. So when you're going back to governance then to answer your question, uh, this is fundamentally a governance issue. Because when we're talking about responsibility, and David's touched on a lot of that, and I won't need to expand on that, fiduciary responsibility and the like, how can you do that? That is part of good governance. It's part and parcel of good governance. If you're not thinking about these issues, one needs to really question how strong your governance is in the first place. Governance is not a separate issue to environmental and social issues. Good governance should be considering these things anyway. And um, that is really the, the fundamental shift that we, that, that, you know, the thinking that's been pervasive, I think, in the South African market. You mentioned the King Codes. The King Codes are for the longest time being considered one of the most advanced governance codes in the world and had uh, for a long time talked about the people, planet, profit perspective ahead of many other stewardship or governance codes in the world. And that's entrenched in the JSC's listings requirements. And that's how you know the encouragement is there for entities to think about the broader perspective and to think about um, environmental social context as well within the context of good governance. So it goes right back to being the responsibility of the governing body within a company. And so that's the perspective from which the exchange has come at it at. So it hasn't been necessarily a challenge to say that the E and the S need to be balanced. It's about saying you have to consider this. It's more your materiality lens in this regard that is the one you need to leverage in your market. And so the work that the exchange does is in trying to promote that thinking for the shift at the governance level, the shift in the business model thinking, its relevance to society primarily, because in the long term, people are invested in that market for that uh, for the long term. We are largely institutional market as well, so our market structure has a lot to do with that. And so if you're coming in as a pension fund invested in the market, while we know that short-termism is entrenched in terms of results and returns, the reality is those investors need to have long-term liabilities that they need to match with their investments. And so, you know, the, the, the easy way to think about this is that, you know, you have to invest in the future you want. Mm. Otherwise, the one you're going to get is going to be worth infinitely less. And so those are the perspectives that you need to balance that E and the S. It's pointless having lots of money 
and you can't breathe, you have no water, and you're paying tons for security because society is so unequal and it's driving those kinds of you know, challenges. So I would think that's the perspective I'd have, and these are things that exchanges need to be so conscious of because you have a huge opportunity to use your convening power to drive that understanding and awareness in the company. You have a vantage point that is really, really uh, unique and uh, is um, something one should be leveraging. You should understand that opportunity to convene, the opportunity to connect, uh, and to be able to connect horizontally, to be able to connect vertically, and to understand the political context, the policy context that you can bring these matters to bear on. And of course, the market context often hel helps, because the moment you start seeing investors being concerned, uh, con uh, concerned about these issues, um, and how they're translating directly into balance sheet impact to risk and things like that, uh, it's suddenly a very different conversation that an exchange can drive. So I think that context is, is very useful as well. Um, and uh, I think uh, you can't avoid getting your feet wet. These are not issues that we should be skirting as markets. They're fundamentally about our existence in the longer term as well. Great, thanks Shamila. And I have to say that JPX certainly hasn't um, shied away from getting their feet wet. Um, and thank you for bringing along a lot of the other exchanges with you in this journey, because I think there's certainly a lot to be learned from your market. Um, I'm gonna move on um, to the Japan Stock Exchange. Haidiki Tomita, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, another leader in the market just announced in July that they would be carbon neutral um, by 2024. So not many years to go now. Um, would you mind sharing with our audience a bit about what are the first steps you're taking to reach that ambitious goal and how you're bringing your market with you um, to encourage your market to also in and get involved in this? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you for having me here today. And I'm Hideki Tomita, uh, Chief Representative in, uh, in Europe. Uh, usually, uh, when these kinds of big conferences are taking place, I think that then our colleagues in Tokyo definitely uh, come here to uh, enjoy uh, joining these kinds of presentations. Right, but this time, maybe, maybe you. But maybe you know that uh, this time, because of the COVID restrictions in Japan, that uh, it's a very heavy restriction. So that's why that all the foreigners, all the travelers uh, to Japan, uh, must be self-isolated for a uh, surprisingly 10 days after returning back to Japan. So that's why uh, anyway, you know, I've given the opportunity to uh, having me here, right? And uh, as regards to your questions, uh, yeah, right, that we made an uh, announcement last summer that we will be in a carbon neutral in 2024. And uh, we already have a step-by-step -step approach. So uh, the first step, that uh, all the electricity consumed in the uh, JPX headquarters uh, uh, change into the uh, sustainable, en uh, sustainable energy, uh, which we call it an RE100. And after that, uh, when we consider uh, the uh, stock exchange uh, facilities uh, consuming a lot of uh, electricity, not only the headquarters, but also the uh, uh, how say, IT facilities or data center or collocation or something like that, uh, they uh, consume a lot of electricity. So that's why we, we are considering to take a very aggressive approach. Well, the first one is that the, uh, we are currently a started the uh, feasibility study of uh, having our own uh, electricity facilities uh, by ourselves. And using these facilities, uh, uh, we are considered, uh, we are currently considered to switch all the electricities consumed in our whole exchange uh, facilities to a renewable one by the 2024. I understand it's a uh, three years is a very short, but then I'm sure that we can make it by the uh, mentioned timeline. Great, and would you mind speaking a little bit to how you're bringing your market along with this? How are you communicating it with your market? Are you encouraging your listed companies to come with you on this journey? Okay, thank you very much. And, uh, it's, uh, apart from the, uh, the net zero um, uh, uh, announcement, but you know that uh, our exchange is also a center of the capital market, so we have a huge, uh, around 3,000 listing companies in, in our exchange. And also, uh, we provide a lot of products uh, or the uh, ESG-related product or the ESG-related indices to the investors as well. So that's why uh, using these kinds of opportunities or activities, we connect each other with our uh, exchange stakeholders. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I might have lost my... There we go. Um, so we'd like to go to our nearly final speaker now. We do have one online as well. Yeah. Sure, David. <laughs> 
Just today, there was the announcement from JPX on their low carbon indexes. I should say, have a, we've been partnering with them on those indexes. But I mean, I, you know, so the real action today, which also then enables investors in Japan and those outside of Japan to be able to decarbonize their investments through, but also really important because JPX has also been engaging the companies listed in Japan around things like climate so um, and around how they get measured on this so that they can understand how investors are shifting allocations based on their transition strategies. Great. Right. Thanks, David. And a great partnership as well to see how all our stock exchanges are working in collaboration. Um, David, I'd like to go to you if I can. So David Colin is from um, Mexique Cero Dos. I don't know if that's how we pronounce it, um, but it's the Mexican um, carbon trading platform um, under the Bolsa um, in Mexico. Um, so can you give us a bit of a perspective of how um, carbon trading platforms can be more innovative, how they can encourage innovation in the market, and how the, at your, your exchange and your market, you're trying to help um, tackle um, this issue from a, an innovative point of view. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Um, well, and thank you to the UNF C for the invitation for this space. I'm really happy to be here with all of you. And thanks to all the organizers. Uh, yeah, just like you mentioned, well, I'm from Mexico CO2, which is a company, a part of the Mexican Stock Exchange. And we work in three different uh, topics. The first one is carbon markets. Um, the second one is renewable energy instruments. And the third one is about green finance. So uh, regarding on your question, um, I think it's very important to uh, notice that markets are evolving. Now markets are changing. Also consumers, everyone is changing their mindset to sustainability. And we have to fa face this uh, new market. So, the Mexican carbon platform um, was originate, originated by these new markets, these new demands. And we are supporting not only large emitters in Mexico, but also small emitters, individuals, and small organizations to, uh, with, with providing, first of all, tools to measure their carbon footprint. It is important to measure their carbon footprints before you offset them and before offsetting it is very important to reduce their carbon footprint. So we encourage all the uh, companies, large emitter and small organizations to follow these three steps before, um, well, while offsetting. And um, I would like to talk about a little bit of the carbon markets that are emerging in, in Latin America. Uh, well, not only in Latin America, but worldwide. Um, and because this is a very important component that is related to the necessity of uh, creating these platforms, right? So um, the importance of the carbon markets in this uh, net zero transition is that um, we are seeing that the carbon markets can be aligned to the accomplishment of uh, mitigation objectives, of mitigation goals uh, national-wide, right? So uh, these carbon markets are emerging not, not only in, in Mexico, for example, that is the first uh, country that adopts uh, a national carbon market in, in, in whole America, in national level. Um, it covers uh, about 45% of the national emissions. So usually these uh, markets are aligned with the NDC's um, commitments that are developed by the different parties. Um, and well, this is very important to say that these kind of markets are initiatives around the world. For example, no nowadays there are 30 initiatives that covers around 16% of global emissions. So it's a, it's, a, it's a share that is increasing. We need to develop more carbon markets in our countries, uh, specifically in the region of Latin America, other countries, for example, Colombia, Chile and Brazil are designing, implementing, and also discussing regarding the implementation of this carbon market. So uh, we are supporting in this process as well, not only in the trading process. And um, what else? Um, I, I think that's, that's kind of a, a very brief um, introduction about how carbon markets are linked with these trading platforms and how we support in the development of this uh, new and innovative markets. 
Great, thanks David. Um, with that, I'd like to go um, to the topic of agility and move online, if we can, um, to Chiara uh, Caprioli, who is from the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. Do we have Chiara available? <laughs> Just gonna check with our tech team back there. Great, Chiara, oh, you're Hello. right behind everyone. Everyone online will see you well, but <laughs> our audience will have to squeeze and look through a few of people. Great, thanks so much for being with us today, Chiara. Um, we know it was logistically very difficult to get here, um, but we appreciate you joining us online. Um, so. Chiara is from the Luxembourg Stock Exchange, which has been uh, really ahead of the curve for some time now on the green bond side. And they have, of course, launched um, the Luxembourg Green Exchange some time ago now. Um, Chiara, can you talk to us a bit about what do you see as the next frontier in financing climate adaptation and mitigation through capital markets? Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tiffany. I think there is a bit of delay between the audio and the video. Uh, I see you speaking on, on the on the screen, but I don't hear anything. So I will go ahead and, and try to reply to your question. Uh, first of all, um, I do represent the Luxembourg Stock Exchange and the Luxembourg Green Exchange. And I would just like to say a word for those of you who might know, not know the Green Exchange. It's the reference platform for the listing and the display of sustainability debt securities. It means uh, green, social, sustainability, and sustainability linked bonds. Um, to the extent that, just to give you a size of the platform, we have today something around 1,100 bonds from 2,110 uh, 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 issuers, uh, sorry about, the, uh, about that, uh, that cumulatively represent more than 500 um, billions of US dollars. So that's really impressive what we have grown in the space of just five years. Uh, you said it, uh, Tiffany, we have been ahead of the curve already with the launch of this platform and we need to continue to be relevant in this space if we want to contribute to our collective objectives which are the same of the industry so scaling up bringing more supply of uh, bankable qualitative pro projects and making sure that the foundations of this market uh, are as integrated as possible and to bring down the risk of fragmentation now in relation to your questioning on the next frontier of uh, climate mitigation and climate adaptation, uh, the first thing I would like to say might sound obvious and is that the next wave of the market will still continue to be pretty much revolving around transparency. So whether we will continue to work in an environment which is soft regulated or even unregulated or in a hard regulated environment, transparency will still be here and it will be improved to make sure that the integrity of the market uh, can be its backbones, basically. And to this respect, I can just uh, mention a couple of um, rewarding um, and reassuring um, activities that are going on in the regulatory space, at least at European level. So what we are seeing is that companies are being pressurized to uh, disclose their level of an alignment, especially in relation to mitigation and adaptation activities, which are the ones that have been defined before for other environmental activities. And on the other side, investors are being asked to substantiate the sustainability nature of their investment. So what we're seeing is a, an increase of the focus of mandatory um, disclosure so that investors can better understand where to put the money and make sure that they allocate the money into qualitative uh, added value um, investment opportunities. The second thing I'd like to mention is that climate mitigation and adaptation are not only about uh, low carbon um, projects exclusively. I mean, uh, we know that mitigation is generally speaking about bringing down uh, CO2 and other gas emissions. And we can't forget that a lot of them is coming from sectors that can't be considered green, but that can't be ruled out from the system uh, in the overnight. Uh, so investors in this respect have understood that supporting transition companies or trans companies from um, highly polluting sectors, but that are hard to abate and for which there are no uh, cleaner alternatives need to be helped to review their models and they need to be pressurized to look at ways to uh, bring down their internal uh,
emissions or, or even scope three emissions uh, consumption. So that's a very interesting development. And because of investor interest being clearly there, we will see a mix of financing of um, green um, uh, projects, green activities, uh, and financing of uh, transition um, activities. Um, I would like to mention to this respect um, another interesting uh, development that is uh, going on uh, since uh, a couple of years, which is the um, uh, stronger link between science and transition finance. So we've seen that for companies to be seen as credible in the space, they will have to come to market with measurable, ambitious, and science-backed um, uh, Paris-aligned pathways. And by doing that, they will have to be referencing science and to be working with external strong partners that can do this job for them. So we will see much more partnership in relation to uh, the sophistication of instruments that will allow this uh, sector to show what they're doing, show that they're doing the right thing, and come up with also measurability into their action. And then the third thing I would like to mention, there are many more potentially, but just to keep uh, our conversation limited to what I think will be the main drivers, is the proliferation of pledges. Uh, we've heard that before on the panel today. Uh, they're coming from industry association, they're coming from uh, individual entities, from companies. I don't think it's just a political um, uh, game. I really think that they're making companies or other groups accountable to define implementation plans and to make sure that they innovate internally to review their models. So what I'm saying here is that we should look at this space, that it's probably too premature to, to come up with any conclusions here, but it's an interesting space to look at, see what is behind the pledges and see to what measurable um, impact uh, this can bring us. Thank you so much, Chiara. They certainly have Thank their you. finger on the pulse there. Can you hear me? I'm just going to see if you can take a follow-up question. Uh, I can hear you. Oh, great. Wonderful. So while we have you on the screen, I'm just going to come back to you to kind of reflect on, um, you know, your role as a stock exchange, your role at the stock exchange, and how you see you, you being able to adapt to these changes you see going forth. So what do you think is the role of the stock exchange in this climate movement? Um, and can your exchange, can you um, be more bold, be more ambitious? Um, where do you think to see those opportunities? I think we need, as I said before, we really need to adapt to continue to be relevant for the market. I think our goals are similar. Uh, first of all, uh, the challenge for all of the exchanges is to strike the right balance between putting the bar higher in terms of encouraging disclosure, uh, encouraging measurability, but at the same time respect the level of preparedness of the market and of companies that list uh, their securities on an exchange. That's difficulty to strike this right balance in terms of listing requirements, which are, of course, more stringent on the green segment of exchanges or, or the green exchanges in, in their own title. Uh, our journey has been a five-year journey just uh, of continuous adaptation. First of all, in the core business, we've had uh, to uh, to make our classification role evolve in relation to the new products that have been produced and codified in the market. So we started with green bonds. We moved to have product-specific uh, standards aligned to the international standards for social and sustainability bonds. And that was the same for sustainability-linked bonds. Now, we've also come up with an innovation, I would say, to the extent we gave visibility and legitimation to those bonds that might not be labeled uh, against international standards, but that are issued by those companies that are generally considered as climate-aligned companies. So companies that have at least 75% of their revenues in green activities up to, of course, 100%. We have wanted to classify them and to show the market that they represent strong, sustainable investment opportunities. Um, even if they're not labeled, and uncover a universe um, to the broad, uh, to the broader sustainable finance uh, catalog uh, of products. That's just one example. Uh, I don't know how much time I have, but I would like at least to mention a couple of uh, additional initiatives. One is the launch of the data hub, and that's really another 
specific market infrastructure and it's um, a depository of data for the fixed income uh, sustainable space that will help to structure information that exists today but that is scattered across very different uh, numbers of uh, information sources and across very different formats so we're bringing structure we're bringing, bringing a normalization of the data points in other words we're trying to bring uh, an ease to the investors in the the sourcing of such information and in the comparability. And the last initiative I would like to mention, uh, I don't know how bold it is compared to the Data Hub, which has been pretty bold, I can tell you, two years of, of work before being able to bring it to market, is our step into uh, sustainable financial education. We launched an academy uh, one year ago. Uh, we have run it virtually because of the pandemic. It's working very well and we're happy to say that we have managed to uh, allow issuers that were first time as issues on the market to be upskilled via the educational services we've been providing. Uh, I will stop here for the sake of time. Happy to elaborate more That's if great. needed. Thanks, Thank Charo. you. Thanks for being with us here today virtually. Um, Thank I'll you so much. Thanks for being here. Thanks. I'm going to move to our panel um, in person with the same question, actually. I'd like you to just reflect a little bit about what is the role of stock exchanges in um, the climate movement and tackling climate change. Um, I think you're all um, here for a reason, so you probably know that quite well. But if you can summarize in a, you know, in a few words, what is your role? Um, and we have you know, about maybe two minutes each to kind of address how you can be bold, how you can be ambitious. Where do you see you as a stock exchange moving forward? forward in um, being ambitious about climate change. Um, uh, I'll start with David because you have a microphone. <laughs> Thank you, Tiffany. Uh, yes, indeed. Well, from the Mexican Stock Exchange, I think one of the main objectives is to keep uh, building capacities because the financial sector has to know uh, what are the implications of climate change so they can diverse, uh, well, they can uh, take different and alternative actions. And um, also another important thing from the Mexican Stock Exchange is to, to be as an example for other actors. And that's why the Mexican Stock Exchange has developing um, climate strategies, like I said before, to measure, reduce, and offset their, their, their carbon footprint. And um, well, also to innovate in financial instruments beyond the green and sustainable bonds so that we can allow all the market participants to achieve their climate goals. I think in, in a summary, it's what I want to say. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Hideki, would you like to continue? Oh, thank you very much. Mm. Uh, our exchange is uh, currently especially focusing on uh, two activities. Uh, one is that to uh, support all the listing companies disclose the ESG related information. And the other activities are that to uh, provide a lot of uh, ESG-related indices and also the products to the investors, which I already mentioned. And then uh, uh, regarding the first one, uh, to support the listing companies, disclose the uh, ESG-related information. Uh, already, uh, uh, as a panelist already mentioned, that uh, uh, our exchange recently revised the corporate governance code. So that's why that the currently the old blue chip uh, Japanese companies, listing companies, but uh, consist of around 1,000 companies, uh, virtually become uh, mandatory for them to disclose the ESG-related information, especially on a TCFD-based. And the other activity is that uh, we joined the Sustainable Stock Exchange several years ago. And they also uh, published the uh, Japanese version, translation uh, version of the uh, Sustainable Stock Exchange uh, model guidance. And also we created, uh, established the, uh, uh, we published the uh, uh, ESG practical handbook and also uh, established the ESG knowledge hub, which uh, gather, put together all the ESG related information, general information into the one integrated website. Uh, what, we, what we are focusing on is that, the, you know, um, uh, we, we, our exchange has uh, 3,000 uh, listing companies. And, uh, and when we're focusing on the blue chip companies, I think it's that they're, not, they're not so difficult to uh, analyze and, uh, how does it call, uh, disclose the ESG related information for themselves. But uh, we have uh, lots of mid and small cap companies. And they, they don't know for sure how to uh, analyze the ESG factors uh, in, each of the uh, in, in each of the listing companies. And also how to disclose uh, these kinds of ESG information. They have a very huge potential 
uh, good uh, ESG information, but they don't know how to disclose it. So that's why we support uh, these kinds of activities to especially the mid and small cap companies or something like that. Great, thank you. And I think a lot of you are working a lot on the educating the market and training. We've just been working closely and um, all, with all of your markets, actually, we're working on TCFD disclosure. So thanks for bringing up the, the side of education. Um, Shamila, can I come to you about um, what's next and bold and ambitious in your market? Oh, goodness, the sky's the limit. <laughs> Good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> next and bold and ambitious. Um, so. I think our role is really to create that enabling environment for better practices to grow and, uh, and to support that market. So creating that enabling environment, of course, is kind of like how long is a piece of string and how far do you want to get involved? And can you? So, you know, it's uh, being able to understand that. So we really see it as creating that enabling environment and that could be through disclosures, through products and services, through using our convening power, advocacy, engagement with the market. Now, that's kind of a, a long shopping list almost, but what we found is that you need to be close to what the market needs. We've just embarked on a project now to consider to issue uh, both ESG and sustainable, uh, sorry, ESG and climate disclosure guidance in our market, and the climate disclosure guidance will be premised off the work we've done with the SSE. And um, it has been honestly illuminating to sit and listen to what uh, what our companies are saying and the challenges that they're facing and the spectrum of understanding within the market that goes from, uh, to Tamita San's kind of point about where on one end of the market you have very advanced issuers who are up the curve and are among the best, you know, uh, kind of disclosures in the world, uh, reports in the world, and on the other end that are just starting the journey and kind of their first question is what is sustainability? And so how do we do that and how do we support that? So. Our, our primary aim is to say that the markets are a force for good, but it takes intent to be able to do that. So we've had to do an element of responsiveness to what it is and where our companies are at, and an element of what is next that we're seeing when we put together all these factors that we're so fortunate to be exposed to and understand, and say, but this is where it's actually going and we need to create that environment. Companies might not see it right now, but if we can see it's going there, investors are asking this policy is changing so rapidly. Um, what is next going to look like? And we then create the enabling environment. When we created our framework for green bonds, social bonds, sustainability bonds, and soon to be transition bonds and sustainability linked bonds, there was an element of, you know, do we know if the market needs this or do we build it and they'll come? And, uh, and it was a combination of the two. There was certainly a bit of boldness that was required, leadership, and just let's go for it. And it's, and it's panned out well. And um, so we see that that's part of our role, is that we've got to constantly be watching what's happening, constantly be understanding, communicating that in our market. Uh, the market sees us as a credible source of information. Uh, and uh, so let's be that credible source and then make sure we're doing that the right way. And then bold, I think, is also using our opportunity to influence policy, decision making, locally and globally. Uh, share our experiences and at the other end also learn very quickly what's happening and bring that into our market to make sure that our markets can remain resilient, attractive investment destinations and ultimately places that, you know, when you're investing your pension fund or whatever, that it is a valuable long-term proposition. Thanks, Shamila. I certainly agree that markets can be a force for good and we will continue to work together <laughs> towards that. David, can you build on that? So I, mean, I think there's the easy stuff that exchanges can do, which is things like the kind of you know, the green bond segments and the kind of you know, we launched a green economy mark uh, for companies, which have more than a certain level of green revenues. But so that's the kind of the easier stuff in, in that you know that's very exciting. Everyone wants to kind of allocate to, to green industries. The more difficult stuff is with the higher carbon industries and how you engage there and support meaningful action. Um, one part of that is the data and disclosure, and actually it's really important that all of us now really. Yeah, exchanges have a lot of soft influence. See, some will actually have, you know, maybe a harder regulatory role, but all of us have at least a soft influence and can help encourage, catalyze better data. But we can go beyond that. And the, so something which and I'd like to call out my colleague, actually, Claire Dorian, who's she's hitting the audience, who, who's you know, her leadership in leading some of this on the capital market side, who heads this up, work up. But what, what she's just launched a week ago was a climate governance score for companies listed in London. So we took... Yeah, we can see in the indexes we're building for all sorts of different pension funds and working with different exchanges that investors are reallocating capital to companies based on those which have got better transition plans. 
But companies need to understand that and understand how investors are looking at them. So what, what we launched was a, was a score. It's at the moment, we're providing it privately to the companies so they can see how they're, how they're being assessed, which is looking at, you know, to me, some things like, you know, uh, have they got senior accountability for climate? Are they reporting their emissions? Are they setting short-term targets, long-term targets? Do they have an internal price of carbon? Are they linking this to executive remuneration? So th there's that part of it. The next bit, which will have to come ne after this, which is the really hard bit, is are the targets that they're setting good enough? Are they going to be aligned with where we need to get to for one and a half degrees, two degrees? That's a more complex piece. We will be coming to that. I can see Julia Hoggart, CEO of the exchange, nodding. Um, but yeah, they, they, these are tough things, but we've all got to work through them because there is not a choice. The global economy has to decarbonize and very rapidly. Great. Thanks, David. And to finish us off today, Harry, can you give us an additional, it's the hardest to go to last, I know, but <laughs> you guys are leading in many areas. So can you add kind of what is your role and how do you see ambition and bold movement moving forward? Yes, yeah, so we, we set a vision to be a leading sustainable and credible transition finance and trade hub with end-to-end -end product solutions and importantly, ecosystem. And we are, we are a multi-asset exchange. Of course, we have our list codes, but there's also fixed income, commodities, uh, commodities hedging in particular, um, you know, data business, indices business. We're launching carbon markets, etc. So, whether it's for future proving, you know, our business, our clients' businesses or whether it's really building on those opportunities and capturing what's to come. We wanted to take a step back and think about where can we and the exchanges overall have the most impact. And where we came to is, for example, around disclosure. So we have the benefit of now having mandated um, disclosures I mentioned for, um, so there's been reporting for four years. So we analyzed those reporting and uh, sort out where were there gaps in terms of disclosures. And one key potential um, missing piece in the future would be lack of comparability and potentially um, accuracy as well. So we have been um, on the back of those analysis, you know, looking to see how can we launch a, a, a data platform to make it easier for companies to report on a standardized material, financially material set of indicators. So we've consulted the market as to what those indicators should be, but with the latest announcements, I mean, sustainability is ever evolving, so with the latest announcements and changes in the disclosures, we've, we will have to continue to factor that in. Um, so again, accuracy, data, cleaning things up, making it comparable, and actually machine readable, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's going to be, it's not going to be, um, today we're facing lack of data in many ways, but in the future the problem is going to be too much data. So how do you help all stakeholders find the right information that's material? Now, when we think about capturing the opportunities for ourselves and our ecosystem, um, as David also mentioned, there the, the big, material thing that in particular in Asia, because we are a hub, that we have to undergo is this transition. We are all focusing on, of course, climate transition, but it's not just climate, right? We've, we've heard, heard the announcements that we want to be nature neutral or positive even um, beyond 2030, et cetera. So um, how do we also then capture the opportunities from these? And um, for that, you know, the, the creating products, financial products that really will move the needle, you have to work with the ecosystem. So that's why we opted to choose to join Net Zero Financial Services Providers Alliance to work together with others, in particular to look at for each of the product lines, how do we drive those services to net zero? And so that's the work that we all are going to be undertaking together. Um, but then it goes beyond climate, right? So for each of the environmental objectives, social objectives, how do we pull these all together? And we have to listen to investors, we have to listen to companies, we have to listen to other exchanges. So it's that ecosystem play that, that, that we really have to drive towards and that's going to be the ambitious part. 
Great. Thanks, Harry. And as much as I think we'd all love to continue this conversation, because um, I think we might all be from the same planet in our objectives here, um, I hope that we were able to kind of send home a bit of a message that stock exchanges are a key player in what we've said a few times, the ecosystem here, in kind of bringing together all the important um, players in the capital market system. And as we've talked about a lot today here, I heard a lot of the words of kind of changing mindsets, putting pressure on behind the scenes conversations, listening to our market and stock exchange play stock exchanges play a really important role kind of working behind the scenes and making sure that there's alignment within the market for that stability we're looking for here today. Um, just to comment on two more things that I think were very um, importantly highlighted here was collaboration and how all of these players, you know, they're leaders in their own right, but they, as stock exchanges, they're leaders, but as collaborators, they're leaders and they're working together time and time again to make sure that this is a movement that's moving forward collectively and globally. Um, and with that comes a lot of governance and a lot of regulatory movement as well. So I'm happy to hear that everyone's working on that together with their regulators. And at the SSE, we also work closely with capital market regulators. So with that, we're out of time. And I'd like to thank everyone for being here with us today. Thank you so much for our panelists for taking the time to have this conversation, um, not only um, for us and those online, but for everyone who was unaware of the role of stock exchanges. I hope they now understand the key role that they play in this movement. Um, also, thank you to our partners, the UNFCCC, Masamba, um, Sylvia. Thank you so much for working together with us on this. Um, and I will just note that we have a, a, another meeting that's happening um, with many of the exchanges here today and their leadership um, on net zero in particular and data. Um, so if that also interests you, please check out the SSE's um, Twitter um, handle, at SSE Initiative, where we have all the information on how you can join that online as well. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon, and good luck at COP. <laughs>